we're going to talk about it. In fact, we were at a conference because of Greg Hood. Greg Hood had a dream, and in the dream, it was Robert giving out mantles. And as a result, uh, we went to this conference, and I was one of the guest speakers or the speakers, and it was probably the most magnificent conference I've ever been in. One was the unity of the Spirit, but the second was the desire of the people. You see, if you're a desirous person, you'll get something. But we have to pull you out of your seat. There's something wrong. All right? So my voice got affected a little bit, so I, I don't know what will happen with that, but just hang on. Now, Robert has this weird thing. He says, everybody turn around and greet someone. But here's the problem. If everybody turns around and greets someone, the people on the front row have got nobody to greet. But wouldn't it be nice to just give someone a five, a fist, an elbow, a head, just something to say hi. It's still not moving. If you're not moving in this, you'll never move in the appeal. Just say hi. Good to see you. How many of you know that every now and then in the ministry you get moaned at? Not by you, you're, you're perfection. But I, uh, I got moaned at, and do you know what it was for? Because on the first day, all the books ran out. And so I, I got moaned at. I want to read you a scripture, and then I want to explain the scripture, and then I want to make you hungry for the potential. I'm going to say this to you. God will never go beyond your thirst. So my job prophetically is always to stir you up to thirst. But I just wanted to tell you, how many of you believe in the prophetic? That means God speaks. How many of you know that when God speaks, it says in Isaiah 55, He not only speaks, but He continues to water what He spoke. And the reason he does that is so that he can continue to build up your faith to continue in what God said. And uh, someone had come into the conference, and the Lord said, you're going to meet somebody to this person. You're going to meet someone in the conference, and I want you to give them a tent peg. And I want you to give them a tent peg with Isaiah 54 written on it. So I'm on the phone talking to Chris about the situation with getting ready for the building. And this person walks up to me and said, I don't know why it's you, but it is you. And they handed me a tent peg with Isaiah 54 on it. And you know what it says? Stretch wide your tents. In other words, what God was saying, I'm confirming you're on the right road. So I want to say this to you prophetically, that when God says something to you, He'll confirm it to you. And then He'll confirm it to you, and He'll water it and water it until it breaks out in you. And you begin to believe it, because if you begin to believe it, then you'll begin to receive it. And if you begin to receive it, you'll begin to confess it. And if you begin to confess it, you'll begin to pray it. And if you begin to pray it, you'll begin to start to manifest it. And here it goes. That's what the prophetic's about. Now, if, you've, uh, if you're visiting us, we believe in the prophetic. If you're visiting us, it's only once. Next time you're no longer a guest, you're in. All right? So it's very important, but guests should have something. So if you've come for something, may God give you something today. So I want you to turn with me to 1 Samuel. Um, I know that Americans tend to say 1 Samuel, but if you look at the front of it, it doesn't say 1, it says 1. Which I want to say, share this with you. That's one of the traditions that already needs to break, that we, we do things by tradition rather than by life. Right? Right? And if you're going to have all that God's going to have for you today, we're going to have to break a few traditions. The Lord so manifested in this church where we were that the pastor and their wife, they were flawed, and I mean the word flawed. They were flawed. Out cold flawed under the presence of God. And the, and the leader came to me yesterday and said, you have set us free. Amen? So many were the slain thereof of the Lord. This is 1 Samuel in chapter 2. Now, this is very, very interesting because 
I'm going to just read a couple of verses, then explain to you what's happening. 1 Samuel 2.18 says, But Samuel was ministering before the Lord, a boy wearing a linen ephod. Now, what you don't know about that is Samuel ministered to the Lord before he met him. He doesn't meet the Lord till the next chapter. That's why people like John Wesley, who had never met the Lord, were ministering to the Lord before they met him, so that their hearts were trained to serve God. So when they met him, they were already in function. And it says in the next verse, and each year his mother made him a little robe and took it to him when she went up with her husband to offer the annual sacrifice. She made him a robe that was too big for him. If the robe wasn't too big for him, she would have made him the robe for last year, but she'd already given him the robe last year, which he already had to grow into. Now she's giving him another robe, but she's not giving it for where he is now. She's giving him a robe for where he will grow into during the next year. Now, you've got to catch the realm of this. God didn't save you to leave you where you are. In fact, it tells us in Song of Solomon, chapter 6 and verse 11, that the Lord goes down into the valley to look for new growth. Which means he's always looking for growth. He, he's wanting to grow you into something. What does he want to grow you into? It's found in Ephesians 4 and verse 19. Who we all grow up into Christ. In other words, God saves you to begin a growth period in you to grow you up into Christ. Not to grow you up into Jesus. If he grows you up into Jesus, he's going to grow you up into salvation. If he grows you up into Christ, he's going to grow you up into his anointing and his manifestation. Is it this not the Jesus who was prophesied in Isaiah 61 and fulfilled in Luke 4, where it says this, that the Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is upon me, and he has anointed me, and he starts to say what he's anointed him to do, to preach, to proclaim, to heal, to deliver. To exchange robes so that you might be oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. The word splendor there is glory. The word display there means you grow up over the top of the wall. It means you break out from where you are and you begin to manifest the glory of God. Jesus did not save you to sing, I'm on my way to heaven, I shall not be moved. He saved you to grow you into the full manifestation of sons of God. He saved you to become like he was and he is. He saved you to seat you with him. He saved you to mantle you to carry the same anointing that he carries. But here's his problem. He's got to get you there. And to get you there, he can't do it in one minute. How many of you know that you're pre-programmed? Isn't it easy today? We can talk computer and everybody gets it. How many of you know you're pre-programmed? You're pre-Baptist, pre-Methodist, pre-Episcopalian, pre-Catholic. And you don't know it, you already think you know everything. But if you already knew everything, how come you don't own much? So because you pre-program, God has to deprogram you to reprogram you and has to get you where he wants you to go. So your growth in God is continual and, and it grows as he can grow you. But God is always preparing for you the next phase of your life. But not only is he preparing the next phase, but he's preparing the next mantle. What is a mantle? It's a cloak. Isaiah 61 and verse 10 says he, he literally clothes us with the garments of salvation, which means he clothes you with being saved. That's the first garment. But then it tells us in Luke 24, 49, that we can be clothed with power from on high, which means that there's other garments he has for you. It's the garments of anointing. It's the garments of office. It's the garments where you start to walk in God in new measures. How many of you know if you got it all at the beginning, you might as well fly away, oh glory. 
Because you're of no use if, if you just get it and then I'm just, I'm saved, hallelujah, that's all I need. No, that's not all you need. What you need is to manifest the sons of God. All of creation is waiting for you to act. So God wants to clothe you and clothe you. So for every one of you in this room and for every one of you watching, he is preparing mantles or garments for your life. Garments for the next stage. Garments for the next year. But how many of you know that when he tries to give you a garment for the next stage, it's going to get very uncomfortable? Number one, you've never walked in it before. Number two, you've never felt it before. Number three, it's too big for you. So when Hannah comes up to Samuel and she gives him the, the garment, he's got so used to last year, he's grown into it. Suddenly she gives him the new garment and it's for a year's growth. When he puts the garment on, he's not used to it, it's too big. She has to be extremely prophetic because she has to guess how big he's going to get in the next year. But the Lord knows how big you're going to get in the next year. He knows the next stage of manifestation in your life. And garments are on offer. How do I know that? Not because I went to a conference. I know that because I had a vision. And in the vision, I was watching and in the air above me, were all these garments and mantles that were prepared for the people of God, but they'd never reached up to take them. And as a result, all these, where we could walk, we weren't walking because we would never reach into the new. Now, there's a reason for that, because the prophetic wasn't working properly. Pathetic is, pathetic is when prophetic is soothsaying. It makes you feel good. The basic gift of prophecy is to make you feel comforted. There's not one of you that doesn't need some comfort. Looking at your faces, it looks quite regular. Of course you do. It's supposed to exhort you. It's supposed to, to stir you and edify you. Basic prophecy. And we, we literally can have that daily. But you need a bit more than that. You need the one from Jeremiah 29, 11, who knows the plans that he has for you and the purposes he has for you to start to speak into your life or to speak into your spirit and to prepare you for the next phase in God that is yours. That's when you need real prophetic or real relationship with the Holy Spirit. Because the one who mantles you with power from on high brings the rest. How do I know that? Listen to the scriptures. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me and. If you ever meet the Holy Spirit, there's a great big and. And he has anointed me. In other words, the Holy Spirit's job is to anoint you or mantle you and continue to anoint you to take you into the places he wants you to be. His biggest problem is to get you there. So the reason the prophetic is here is to tell you something beyond you. If I've heard it all before, then I've not been listening at all. But if I heard something beyond me, then I know that that beyond me is something that God wants to take me to. And he always says, I'm going to show you something that you can't see. I'm going to speak of something that you don't understand. But by the time I finish, you will see it, you will understand it, and you will grasp it, and you will walk in it. How does God do all this? We'll get there in a second. Watch this. Elijah is told to go and anoint Elisha. Elijah's prophetic enough to know it's not just an anointing. So he takes his mantle or his cloak off, which is his garment from God. He walks up behind Elisha in 1 Kings 19, 19, and touches him or throws the garment on him. He hits him with something too big for him. He hits him with something that he cannot yet wear. He hits him with something that will change his life if he will go after the something that hit him. In other words, it was beyond him, but it was obtainable. See, come on, I'm, I'm going to get real with you. 
I love to go to conferences. I love to meet men that have met God. But I don't want to meet them to meet, to just listen to them. I want to meet them to know how to get what they got, then run beyond what they got. How did they get what they got? Because I want to know how you got what you got. Because when I found out how you got what you got, I'm going to reach in and get what you've got. But there's a lot more for me to get than what you got. It's time that the Christian entertainment theater stopped. My job is to stir you up. I tell people I'm like Rocky V. The real prophetic people are, if you really meet prophetic people, they stir you up. What's Rocky V? Well, it's the one between Rocky III and Rocky IV. Now, Rocky V is very simply the one where Rocky won't fight the guy in the ring. It's the, the one that the actor is, you know, John Wayne's grandson. He won't fight him in the ring. And so John Wayne's grandson doesn't understand in the movie that you don't go and reach into a street fighter and fight him on the street if you're used to the ring. So he walks into the pub, rub-a-dub-dub. That's how the Londoners say it, right? He walks into the pub and picks a fight with a street fighter in a pub. The street fighter then whips his donkey. I came out of that movie, because I was an ex-street fighter. I came out of that movie and I said, I just want to fight someone. <laughs> what did it do? It stirred something up in me. It's like any of you ex-football players, because you look like ex-football players. Like any of you ex-football players, do you ever watch a real good game? Say, I want to do it again. Let me, give me that ball. Oh, come on, you do, don't you? That's what the prophetic is supposed to do to you. You, you don't sit there and say... Oh, hallelujah. Oh, what a prophetic word. It makes me feel so good. Oh, Lord, I just love you so much. That was actually a trip. That's the trouble. I was looking so far ahead of me that I didn't see the edge. But folks, if, if, you, if you come to this church all the time and I don't stir you up, I've lost my voice to you. And I just need to live on the road and stir up the people who want to be stirred up. I'll find out if you're stirred up any minute now. How many of you want what God has for you? Listen, listen, when Elijah in 2 Kings 2 turns around to Elisha, who has been touched with the potential of something bigger in his life, he says to him, what do you want? And he says back, I'll tell you what I want, what I really, really want. I know what I want. I've been affected. I know what I want. And see, if God can't put the want in you, you'll never move from where you are. And you see, he shows you something. You'll see it in a moment. He stirs you with something to see if you will want something. But if you never want the something, you'll never get the something. I actually believe, and I believe this intensely, that there are going to be people who reach heaven glad they're saved and the Lord's going to go like this. He's not going to say, well done, good and faithful servant. He's going to say, oh, the potential. But you would not see beyond the bridge of your nose. You wouldn't risk. You see, the trouble is when God shows you something that he has for you that is beyond you, there is, there is a, a very costly moment. If God offers you a new mantle, if he offers you a new place because he wants you in a new place, there will be some cost somewhere in your life. See, Abraham built an altar, and at the altar, every day he went before the Lord because he'd already paid the cost. He'd left his family. He'd left his home. He'd left his country. And now he's wandering around like a nomad in the middle of the wilderness waiting for the city that he's seen. It says, Hebrews 11, he's seen something beyond himself. Waiting for the production of what God has told him. There is a cost. If you haven't paid a cost, you're not moving. 
I watched uh, a little bit on Facebook because uh, you, you have to watch um, a couple of our people on Facebook. They're different. And I was watching a, a certain person that was about to move that you would know, one of our leaders. And he was putting the description from one house to the other. But the cost was he had to pack up his belongings and buy some new stuff because he didn't have enough in the old place for the new. There was a cost to it. And when you I was talking about you, by the way. But I didn't want to be heckled with it because then I'd have to answer you. And you know how that goes. And I'm very fast on my feet. So if you do, then I'll get one back. But, but I watched it with interest. There was a cost to move. There's always a cost to move. See, we, we've gone into what's called 21st century, 20th and 21st century comfortable Christianity. Crying out. Oh God, would you move? While I sit on my comfortable seat in my comfortable church doing comfortable things. Elijah leaves his home and is driven from the presence of the king. Abraham walks in the wilderness. Moses walks in the wilderness because of the cost of that which they were going to walk into. And we need to understand that when God offers you something bigger and he wants to give you something bigger, there is going to be a cost to your life. The cost sometimes, my friends, is taking off the old coat to put on the new one because the old coat now fits. For instance, even, even like the prophetic, even though I'm naturally shy, which some of you just don't know that, but I'm naturally shy. I hate being watched, and sometimes I stop ministering because I hate being watched. And you say, well, what are you doing up there? Cost. I'd rather be paid the same money for being in Barbados. Of course I would. It's true, isn't it? I want to serve you, Lord, from the high seat of Barbados. Because <laughs> there isn't one. All right, so. Folks, the cost of stepping in. Sometimes it's the cost of a change of mind. Sometimes it's the cost of the comfortable place. We all say, give me more until God gives you more. Now more demands more. And sometimes, I don't know if you know this, but when you get more, not everybody likes you. I love conferences like I went into. Everybody was the same. If you said you want more, yeah, that's why we paid all the money. We want more. Yes, my voice is gone. I'm sorry. But most people won't even move from their seat for more. We'd rather be comfortable. Surely if God's in it. it shouldn't it be comfortable? I don't know what Bible you read. And instantly, I've probably lost half of you and half of you because I don't want anything to cost me, said they looking at him on the cross. I love that old thing. I said to Jesus, how much do you love me? And he stretched out his hands and died. But here's the problem. When I put something new on, for instance, even though I'm naturally shy, it isn't that hard now for me to prophesy. I've now learned how to hear, to see, to move, to step out. It's not that uncomfortable anymore. So when I go to these big conferences, they say, Dennis, do you have anything? Yeah. Why do you have something? Because I'm wearing my comfortable robe. In my comfortable robe, I hear and I see and I smell, and I can even know things you've done because you haven't repented of them. That's easy. But then when God says, yeah, but I have a robe for you that is now new and bigger and a far greater responsibility to do something you've not done before in me. It is easier to retract to that which some people think is out on the edge, which actually is no longer on the edge, but it's in the realm of comfortableness. But to go into the edge of stepping off the platform into the unknown, many people will not do it, but you'll never get there without it. 
That's why when Elisha did receive the mantle from Elijah, he had to go probably naked to the waters and say, where now is the God of Elijah? I've never been here before. I've never done it before. I've watched him do it. I've never done it. I'm now right on the edge. If it goes wrong, the sons of the prophets are going to see it. But if I don't go there, I'll never go there. Catching this. See, the comfortable of where I sit is the greatest danger of the next phase in God. The comfortable even of this church, and this isn't that comfortable. We are next out. Have you ever seen the giraffe women? Anybody ever watch anything apart from Snoopy? The giraffe women every year put a new ring on their neck. And truthfully, the, the rings on the neck are now holding their necks. If you ever took the rings off, they, they, would, they would die because they've stretched their necks, the vertebrae, in their necks out. And what they do is every year they get, and some of them wear 16 rings on their neck. It looks very elegant. But that's the cost of being a giraffe. You might get your neck put out of joint. You might get your shoulder put out of joint. Someone might steal your seat. I don't mean your seat, but the one you sit on. What a cost. I don't know if that fits me. I don't know how I'll I'll operate in there. But I'm going to put my neck out. I am going to put my neck out. I'm going to take a risk. I'm going to see if God's in this or not. Because I want to fulfill everything that I'm supposed to fulfill in my lifetime. I want to serve the purpose of God in the fullness of God. I don't want to meet God. And he said, but Dennis, you were too afraid to take a step out of your comfortableness into something new in God. I mean, our church is like that. We're stretching way out. Even on the day I stood up and I told you the need, and I I said, Lord, it looks like I'm just going to have to give that that land up. He said, tell the people. But I didn't realize when he meant tell the people that the other people were watching. And people that we've ministered to for years around the world suddenly started sending money in because we stretched out the next step. And God had, but until we stretched out, he did nothing. Are you catching this? Sometimes you're going to have to be prepared to change. You know, Starbucks used to put a thing on the cup and it used to say, the way I see it. Because the way I see it is always the way it is. Because the way I see it, I mean, there's God and then there's me. And if any of you have lived more than five minutes, you'll find out that what you think isn't that great. How many, come on, be honest with me. Can we have a conversation? How many of you used to have a pet doctrine? A pet doctrine, you, something you thought you knew that nobody else quite had. Oh, no, I I know that. I'm on my way to heaven. I shall not be moved from my doctrine. Until one one day God says, wrong. And you go, I've stood on that for years. Wrong. Learn these words. Watch this. I'm sorry. I was wrong. I've noticed only three people spoke. Let's try this again. This is really important. Number one, if you're married, you need to practice this. Number two, if you're going to move on with God, you've got to practice this. I'm sorry. I was wrong. I found something else. I don't know as much as I thought I knew. I found something else out. There's always more. (laughs) 
Sometimes, you haven't even, we haven't even hit the big thing yet. Sometimes, God will have you serve someone who walks in a mantle higher than you in order to equip you to have it. Now, I'm going to, I saw about five of you nod your heads. This is really good for you because it means you're oiling your neck. This is good stuff. Five of you, I don't know where the other 95 or however many there are here, they locked. God's methods are fathering and discipleship. Most anointings are caught. They are not bought. So Elisha, when touched by something bigger than him, gives up everything. And he's plowing with 12 yoke of oxen. Guys, he's rich. He's got a great future, and suddenly God touches him with a greater one. The problem is his great future has servants, and now he's been offered to be one. And most of us hate serving anyone. See, I've only got two nods. We've gone down to... Uh, I don't think I polished my shoes this morning. Oh, look at that scuff. And you know, most people never find their destiny because they will never serve someone who ranks higher than them in the kingdom. I'm uh, 68. Hold on, I just went through the shot. You are 68. Oh dear, you're 68. Hold on, I'm just as still as the shock waves are just going through. But I don't look bad for 68 because I've seen some other 68 year olds and I look pretty good. But it's, it, it's nothing to do with that because you would be saying, well, at 68, there's nobody else to serve. But I just got approached by someone who used to walk with the famous Ern Baxter. And he's 80-something. And he said to me, will you serve on my executive leadership? And I thought, oh, man, that's, that's a bigger coat. Oh, man, that's uncomfortable. That's going to cost me something. And this is what I said to him. I honor you. Therefore, I will serve you. Why did I say that? Because that man walks in a wealth of God. And if just getting around him or Zooming with him or whatever I need to do means God can rub something off that man onto me, it is worth serving him. I just served a man five years my younger who clearly walks in an anointing like I haven't met for years. And I would give deference to him even though I hear God possibly more than him. But I would give deference to him. Why? Because I honor who you are and I will serve you. What would you like me to do? Why? Because when you learn to serve, you grow. When you learn to serve, God can cause things to be rubbed off onto your life. When you pick up someone's uh, handle of a suitcase, you don't know what just touched it. I had a man that was so powerful in the spirit, he began me off. He was so powerful, if he lifted up his hand like this, waves would come off his hand. I was the senior pastor of the church. I invited him. You know what? I became the chief catcher. I wouldn't let anybody else catch but me. Why? Because as I served him, the waves were hitting the person and coming past the person and hitting me. Folks, if you want to gain all that God has, you've got to be big enough to serve in the department where God has touched your heart that you're about to walk. That includes sewing. Bill Johnson praying for, 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 to, to catch the realm of, a, of anointing that he's been praying has been sewing money into Smith Wigglesworth's granddaughter. 
Why? Because I'm sowing into that which I want to walk into. Powerful things. How on earth does God get you? I mean, just pretend that you're not around prophetic people for a minute, which is hard now because they're everywhere. Good, bad, and ugly. But just pretend, how does God get you? God gets you because, number one, he puts a want in your heart. I would walk down the street unsaved. I'd gone to church because that's what we had to do because that's what my dad made us do. He didn't know Jesus. I didn't know Jesus. And I'm not sure half the church even knew Jesus. The most exciting thing in the church I ever, ever went to was communion. Why? Because the old ladies would race to the front to see who could to get there first. And I would love to watch it. To get there. That was the most exciting thing. But I remember saying to myself, as I was walking down the street, things about Jesus. Because something had already pricked me. And it wasn't long, my friends. Some of you come on from Catholic churches. Something hit you. Something stirred you up. You didn't even know what it was. There was a want came in you. Now, I'm trying to think how old I am versus... Now, this would be 38 years ago. A man called Roy Harden would come over to England. And Roy Harden is Benny Hinn's father-in-law. And one year, he brought this guy over called Benny Hinn, this young guy. And he said, you need to hear what he has. And this young guy, Benny Hinn, who nobody really knew at the time, begins to talk about his relationship with the Holy Spirit. Something went off in me that reached in and grabbed me, and I knew that God was saying what that man had, I was to have. I didn't know how to get there yet, but I knew that God put a want in me. Why does he put a want in you? Because when you want something, you're willing to do something about the thing you want. Come on. You want to be a doctor, you're prepared to do the studying. Because when we want it, we're prepared to do it. That's why when you begin to make excuses, we know you lost your want. But if you got one, you got one. I mean, I don't know if Christine remembers this. We've been married a while. I remember running four miles across town. And when I went across town, it wasn't flat. It was downhill, and, and as they said in Yorkshire, up dale. I went down, I went up, and I went down, I went up again. But I was there at 8 o'clock in the morning when she came out of the house to go to work. Nowadays, we'd send a text. you got no want, my friend. I had a, a guy in our church recently whose car broke down and he lived half a mile away from where the church met. And he told me he couldn't make it to church because his car broke down and he didn't have a lift. You're talking to the wrong man. Where's your want gone? When a want is in you, you are ravenous. Just to prove it, I like to illustrate things with dogs because dogs are a little bit honest. They haven't learned Christianity. Right. My dog was, on, was looking at us yesterday like this. She tried Christine. And she tried me. She tried Christine. She tried me. Well, we couldn't figure out what she wanted. So I said, do you want to come up here? You know, because she loves, she loves to cuddle Christy in particular. So she came out. And, but Christy said, I'm just, I'm not, it's not here, is it? 
So she says, so do you want some water? So she took her out and the dogs lapped some water because she's just, you know, hungry to have something. Walked back in there and we found out between Christian and me, she placed a toy. And she wanted us to pick up the toy and throw it. She hadn't lost her want. And even though we watered her and cuddled her, she still wanted us to play with the toy. Don't you think you got a little bit sophisticated in your walk with God? Well, I want it, but... Come on, I've heard people say, well, the Lord knows my address. Of course He knows your address. That's why you're saved. But do you know His address? Are you the one knocking on the door saying, you put this in me, sir. I know it's beyond me and I know I'm not yet perfected. But goodness and mercy does follow me. And in my case, I know why. God will put a want in you. Do you have a want in you? Does this church have a want in it? Do some of you have a want in you? That they, you know that there's this mantle, this new place in God that is yours. The second thing in God's things, he puts more than a want, he puts a desire. Psalm 37 and verse 4 says this, that if you delight yourself in the Lord, he will grant the desires of your heart. Now, a want is one thing, but a desire is another. Because a desire just has to have what it desires. It thinks about, it prays about, it thirsts after, it gets moved by because it desires. Who puts the desire in you? you delight yourself in him, he's, he's stirred up a desire in you. I'm trying to tell you something prophetically. Some of you are desiring things that you think you'll never have, but the desire will never go away. If the desire will never go away, I've got this feeling that there, it is there for you. I'm not afraid of crying, weeping people. I'm afraid of dead ones. Because you can only raise the dead so many times. You can calm people down, but to keep stirring them up is, a, is hard work. No wonder, no wonder ministers take Monday off. But I guess this church isn't like that. Keep going, keep going. Have you got a desire? Have you got a want? Have you got a want? Have you got a desire? It's something brewing within your being that is stirring you up and saying, I, I just got this, I got this, I've got this. Like my, my wife doesn't even know sometimes she gets so annoyed. And she's, she's got a right to, she's Scottish. You've got to understand, Scottish people can get annoyed. I've always joked with people, if you want to upset an Irishman, it's really simple what's going to happen. They're going to fight you. Then they're going to feel terrible about it. And then take you in, into the pub and buy you a Guinness. If you're religious, I'll get rid of you fast. But, <laughs> but a Scots person, if you make them mad, you have got a fight on your hands. And she just got mad. And she just got mad. She said, I, I just don't know what I feel about this healing thing. What she's really saying, it is my desire. It is my longing. Where is the healing? Why is it the women are always louder than the men? And that's the other question I got. I felt very lonely. Thank you, brother, for coming up the front. I felt so lonely up the front. It's the women. And then, come on, let's dance. Even though they weren't moving too much, they were moving a bit. And I turned around and looked to the men. Come on, dance for it. What are you doing? I'm moving my toes. You can't see it. <laughs> There's got to be some more expression than that. I guarantee when you see a touchdown from your team, you just don't go. When I desire something, I go for that. 
The next thing God does, because I still haven't brought you to the big boy. The next thing God does, he will touch you with little touches of it. He'll give you a touch. He'll give you a dream. He'll let someone touch you. He'll let someone pray for you. He'll let someone walk past you. Mine was in Spain. That's what ch- turn, turned me upside down. I heard about a person and I spent the day, didn't we? We spent the day finding this person and found out why. Never felt such glory in my life. But he wasn't the only person. I met another person who I knew before he touched God was just a nice guy. He literally went to do that to me and a wave hit me. And it made me go, I got to have, I got to have. The touches are moving me. There's no reason you would touch me if you don't want me to have this. Why is this cry come up in the midst of me? Because there's a greater mantle for me to walk in than I've ever walked in. Now get this locked in you. I've only got a couple more minutes. God is no respecter of persons. But can I say something in a London accent? But persons is respecters of themselves. It means we're so busy disqualifying ourselves that the blood of Jesus was made null and void. He didn't start a good work in you, Philippians 1.6, to not complete it. He wants the completion to be you walking in the fullness of what God has for you. So here comes the big one. Micah 2 and verse 13, I'm going to quote it to you, makes this statement. He that breaks open the way will go break open the way and go out before you. And then you will break through the gate. And you will follow him. God will offer you nothing that he's not already obtained for you. Jesus will offer nothing that he hasn't already gained. But by his spirit wants to lead you into the destiny of your life. Here's his problem. He's broken open the gate, but the gate closed. Because he's trying to find anyone around that will open the gate and follow him. What is your gate? Is your gate your understanding? Is your gate your failures? Is your gate your religion? Is your gate your view of yourself? Lord spoke to me and I I, I said, my God, I haven't even got time to look this up. He said, yes, son, goodness and mercy follows you. But there are seasons when goodness and mercy overtakes you. In other words, I'm not just following you. I want to so overtake you that it will overcome you and it will break whatever it is you're fighting in your soul. Your gate might be your own possibilities. Your gate might be your view of what you believe, but it's a gate. And Jesus said in Matthew 16, 18, that the gates of hell will not prevail. And the word there means they can't hold you back. Now, I haven't run into too many gates here because of the way that the housing is here. But back where I come from, there were gates. Almost every house had gates. I can't remember walking up to a gate. I've seen a couple of things on gates like beware of the dog. I've even seen a sign, close the gate. But I've never walked up to a gate and says, oh, the gate said, I'm waiting for you. When you come, I'm going to leap off my hinges and I'm going to beat you down. What normally happens is Dennis Wayne walks up. Grabs the gate and says, you will open. For there is a new door to walk through. You will open. You 
see, what the Lord is looking for is when the Spirit of God in you wants to break open your own gate. I'm not just preaching, my friends. I'm prophesying. I'm prophesying to anyone that wants to listen. The Lord has already shown me a wave breaking. And when the wave was breaking, I knew that the thing had already broken in the Spirit. It wasn't a wave mounting. It was a wave breaking, which I knew. And when I saw the wave breaking, I had to tell Robert, it wasn't just a pure wave. It was all sorts of mess and mire in the wave because the wave pulled up all the hindrances and brought them down with it. A wave is breaking, but can it break over you? A wave is breaking, and can our church become the place it's supposed to be? Can the one who breaks open the way break open the way through you? There's something stirring up in you that wants to break open where you are and say, my God, I know there's another mantle for me. I know there's another arena to walk into. I want to break open the way. All this is is a preliminary message. What do I mean? It's the introduction. But if I can't, can I just say this? With you? Don't, if, you're, if you're a guest, don't you worry about making a fool of yourself. If you're hearing God speak, not me, but if you're hearing God, he's saying, I'm looking for some people that I can break open the way in. Now watch what it says. They follow him through the gate. It means that God will never lead you anywhere he's not prepared for you. He will never lead you where he will not be with you. He'll never lead you where his anointing won't come to you. But he wants to lead you through. I'll give, I'll, give you a, I'll give you a hint to anybody watching, my, my dear sister, and saying, well, that's a bit extreme. It's not extreme when it's you, is it? It's only extreme when it's not you. How many of you, where you are, say, my God, I'm, I'm hearing you. I believe that you have prepared a mantle for me that is bigger than the one I'm walking in. I believe you prepared the way for me, and I want to get out of my own gate. I'm going to tell you something just by faith. I'm going to do something by faith. You see, when Eli, Elisha grabbed Elijah's mantle, he had to break open the way in his own life. And he said, look, I've never done this, but where is the God of Elijah? I have to step into the new. I don't know how it works, but I'm going to break it open anyway. Folks, that's what God is up to right now. I want you to reach. I found out two people... No, three people can give out mantles. Anyone that possesses one, any apostle and any prophet. Apostles because they carry something, prophets because they see it and they've been given the right to impart it. But the truth is you're the one that knows what it is you're grasping for. God, give us a thousand Marys. I'm watching Rudy watching me. Are you big enough to, to get out of where you are and prophetically reach out to God and say, I don't know everything. I just know I heard something that moves me. You ready for it? I want you to tell God what it is you want. Elijah said to Elisha, what do you want? Tell him. Don't whisper. Tell him what you want.
All I'm going to do, <laughs> I say all I'm going to do, I'll do whatever I'm told to do, but all I'm going to do this morning is prophetically release something. What do I mean prophetically? Because I've heard God, I'm going to just release the prophetic of it. It's up to you to reach into God because deposits will start to come. Mantles might even hit you. But the beginning of a new day is about to birth in your life. I never prophesied to my wife. But I'm prophesying to you. The Lord just said to me, the Lord just said to me, I'm going to give her a mantle of healing. Do you get that? I'm prophesying to you. The Lord is going to give you a mantle of healing. He's going to have you touch the untouchables and move on the ones that can't be moved and you'll come so softly that you'll be shocked at the glory that will hit. For the Lord just said to me, I have begun to birth a wave of healing. But I have to come in and heal my bride. Now, Holy Spirit, I thank you. You've attested everything, everywhere. So I release your attestation. Take it. Take it. Take it. I'm going to say something to you. Like Hezekiah, the Lord has reserved many years yet for your life. So take it. Take it. Heal her. Now, Christine, run over and lay hands on her. If you want distant memories, says the Lord. I'm going to take your memories and I am going to make the memories that have hurt you so badly, so distant that they will no longer haunt you. But haunt you they have. I'm going to heal your memories so that they were like some distant movie that you watched. Now how people, I want the, where's the hungry people? 